Hi everyone, um, so I'm Anne Melon, I am professor at the University of Zurich and uh, it's a great pleasure to be part of this series of, uh, of talks uh, devoted to the launch of uh, Elisa's book. Uh, my own talk is entitled Epistemic Innocence and How to Rate Irrationality. And uh, the talk's plan is as follows, so I will start with a brief reminder of what is epistemic innocence. I will try to get into quite a few details regarding the notion. Then I will tell you a few words about the underlying way mechanism that epistemic innocence presupposes. And I will end up uh, on, uh, by raising uh, uh, what can be seen as a worry for for epistemic innocence. Uh, so that just makes the th three parts of the talk. Um, so epistemic innocence, so just to remind you, uh, according to Lisa, uh, belief is epistemic innocent when it is irrational, which means ill-grounded or maintained despite the evidence to the contrary. Another characteristic of epistemically innocent belief is as follows. The adoption, maintenance, or reporting of the belief makes a positive contribution to the believer's capacity to pursue and attain her epistemic goals. This is a very important one. And the third uh, feature of epistemically innocent belief is the following. Uh, this adoption, maintenance, or reporting the adoption, maintenance, or reporting of a less epistemically irrational belief than the one we actually hold will make a less positive contribution to the believer's capacity to pursue and attain uh, epistemic goals. What I find it, what I find important to see that we can sort of sum up these three features by saying that when a belief is epistemically innocent, there is something bad about this belief. Of course, it is irrational. There is something good about it because it has these positive consequences yeah, as far as the epistemic goal of the believers uh, of the believer are concerned. And there is also something better about this belief than one that one could have held in uh, similar circumstances. So this is what I call the condition of betterness. So these three features are essential. And uh, what I would like to emphasize is that this condition of badness is very important in Lisa's account of epistemic innocence. Yeah. Uh, let me just explain this. Uh, here is a, I think, kind of, simple way of understanding this. So suppose that I meet Lisa and uh, to congratulate her for a new book, I offer her a gift, yeah? So this is something good, obviously. I mean, if the gift is nice, yeah, but let's assume it is the case. And this is some, there is something better about this action that another one that I could also have performed, which would, which is, for instance, not giving Lisa uh, any gift or any reward for her book. So, but this, so the two condition here, condition of goodness and condition of benefit, they are fulfilled with, but not the first one. And this explains why this is not an this is not an innocent action. This is simply a good action. Yeah. To have an innocent action, you need to have, this is the point of the example, this condition of badness uh, that I mentioned previously. So here is an example in which the three conditions are fulfilled. So suppose that I see Lisa from, I would say like, let me say 10, 15 meters, and I see that in fact there is a pickpocket turning around her, trying to steal her laptop. And in fact, Lisa is absent-minded. And so I try to draw attention on the fact that there is someone ready to steal her laptop by throwing a ball 
on her face. I'm sorry for this. Uh, so that hurts. Yeah, so it's a bad action in a way. But thanks to these actions, Lisa realizes that there is someone ready to steal a laptop and uh, she just keep it like this and uh, the person has to go away. So this is an example of an, of an innocent action uh, because there is something good about this. So I hurt Lisa, so that's bad. There is something good because the consequences of my action are good. The action uh, allow Lisa to avoid being stolen by the, per by the person. And there is something better about this that, so in the sense that it's better action than the one, than the, than the failure of acting. Yeah, if I had just seen this happening, but had done nothing, that would have been worse than what I have actually done. And because the three conditions are fulfilled in this case, this is an innocent actions, action in Lisa's sense. Yeah. So this is something uh, Lisa presents in her first chapter. And she also say that this way of understanding innocence, epistemic innocence in the case of belief, so innocence in the case of action, just as I've, that just as I've just presented, this innocence is in fact equivalent to something we find in the philosophy of law, which is the justification difference, yeah? So basically what this means is that uh, the delusional optimistic bias and epistemic are, so delusional optimistic bias belief are epistemically innocent, innocent as Lisa wants to show in her book, yeah, in which sense are they so? They are epistemically innocent in the sense that they are epistemically justified, but, and that's a very important comment for the people working in traditional epistemology, what is meant here with epistemically justified belief is very different from, from what is usually meant by epistemic justification in contemporary epistemology. But I very much like this use of justification that is in fact presupposed in the book because it makes uh, the ordinary concept of justification uh, it matches, in fact, sorry, the ordinary concept of the justification. So the idea here is that for an action, for an X, so action or belief to be justified in certain, in, in certain circumstances is for X to be the lesser evil in these circumstances. And this is this kind of ordinary way of understanding what it is to be justified, matches the ordinary concept of justification, as I've just said. And this is a view I defend, in fact, in a paper runner that I publish more or less uh, recently, yeah. So I very much like this idea. Uh, that was just a side comment. Okay, so I promised you to say a bit more about epistemic innocence. So to just like kind of try to, yeah. I try to really explore this notion in as much detail as I can. And, um, uh, this is what I tried to do in this next, uh, in this, uh, in the two next slides. Yeah. So, uh, what is an epistemically innocent belief? So, once again, let me try to explain you this by using these scales of epistemic value that you can see now on your slide. So, when an epistemic, when a belief is epistemically innocent, I've just said it is an irrational belief that contributes to the achievement of the believer's epistemic goals. And this irrational belief is not as bad, is a lesser evil, or is better than a belief that is in fact, that is irrational, that is less irrational, sorry, but that will contribute less to the achievement of the believer's epistemic goal. So this is the idea of what it is to be epistemically innocent. This is an irrational belief. It contributes the achievement of the, to the achievement of the believer epistemic goal and a belief that will be less irrational and will contribute less to the achievement of the believer's epistemic goal will not be as good as this one here. So we can try to 
illustrate this con quickly, concretely, sorry, thanks to these scales of epistemic value. So what it means is that the irrational belief is bad. This is the good, this is the belief which are good epistemically. Here are the beliefs that are bad epistemically. Yeah? And so what happens here, this belief is epistemically innocent because it is bad at a level minus one, for instance, but a belief that the belief that will be less irrational and will contribute less to the achievement of the believer's epistemic goal is bad at the level minus minus five, for instance. Yeah. So this is not as bad as this. Yeah. Or put differently, this is better than this. Yes. And this is what epistemically innocent belief capture, yeah? This relation of betterness or of, I am a lesser, I am the lesser evil belief is on this side and this is a belief which is bad and even worse, yeah? Okay, so what I've done until now is simply to, I've simply tried to explain you in some detail what is the no this notion of epistemic innocence and I hope I have done this faithfully. Um, now uh, we reach the second part of this brief talk uh, and in the second part, in this second part I would like to um, explain you what is the underlying way mechanism that is presupposed by you know, this notion of epistemic innocence. So as we have just seen, what happens when a belief is epistemically innocent is that it is in fact not as bad as another one which would be less irrational. Yeah. Uh, so what does it mean exactly? So how do we in fact reach this amount of badness here that I've just uh, show you in the last slide? Yeah. So what might be the case, so it's just an example, so when at least the figures are just, uh, are not fixed, so you can take any figure you like, but suppose we have an irrational belief, degree minus eight, yeah? And uh, so this is quite bad, it's quite an irrational belief, yeah? So it's much worse than one that would be here, for instance, on these scales of epistemic value. And what happens when the belief is epistemically innocent that is that this minus eight value is compensated by some positive contribution to the achievement of the believer's epistemic goal. So we move from minus eight to minus one because we add here seven, yeah. And that is how we end up having this value here, minus one. We did, we computed the irrationality of the belief together with the positive contribution to the, the achievement of the believer's epistemic goals. And what is true about this irrational belief that contribute to the achievement of the believer's epistemic goals is also true of what we do when we try to evaluate the value of this less irrational belief that contribute less to the achievement of the believer's epistemic goals. What we do is that we add to the value that uh, matches the irrationality of the belief. So this one is a bit less irrational than this one. So this is a minus six on the value on the epistemic scale with regard to its irrationality, but the contribution to the believer epistemic goal is a bit uh, less powerful, so it's only a plus one, let's say, and then we have minus six plus one, we got minus five, and the conclusion is that this one is not as bad as this one because this is minus one, this is minus five, and this explains why this one is in fact the epistemically innocent one because it is a lesser evil. So this is what we concretely do, I think, uh, when we in fact try to decide which belief is the epistemically innocent one. We do 
weight the irrationality of the belief against the positive contribution to the achievement of the believer epistemic goals and we do it twice also for the counterfactual belief that we could have had which will be less irrational yeah and we compare the two results the two results yeah and that gives us that help us designing which one is in fact uh, the epistemically innocent one so that's just a way of uh, illustrating the same idea this idea that we compute both aspect irrationality and the contribution to the epistemic uh, to the achievement of the believers epistemic goals when we try to uh, decide which of the beliefs is the epistemically innocent one. So I've tried to illustrate this with by showing you that what we do that simply we just take a certain amount of irrationality, we just add to this the amount of value that the beliefs has because of epistemic value, yeah, that the belief has because it helps achieving epistemic goals. And this gives us our amount of epistemic value. And we do it the same for the counterfactual belief, the, the, the alternative that we have in the same circumstances. And then we end up seeing that this is not as bad as this. And so this is the one which is, which is epistemically innocent. So the important things to note is that to end up being able saying, oh, here is the irrational, the epistemically innocent belief, we need to go through this computation of two kinds of values. So we need, and um, we need to, in fact, weight the, ir the irrationality of the belief against the good result that it has for the, uh, in re with regard to the achievement of the epistemic goals. And uh, so this is one of my main conclusions in this talk. What this means is that the notion of epistemic innocence presupposes that the irrationality of the belief can be weighed against the quality of the epistemic goals that the belief allow achieving. So this is something that this notion, which is crucial to Lisa's book, presupposes that we can weight both things, irrationality and epistemic goals against each other. And in fact, this, this possibility, the possibility of weighting these two things against each other is quite controversial. And this is going to be my conclusion. I'm going to try to show you why it's not obvious that we can do this. So one, the first problem is that irrationality does not seem to be a goal itself. Let me try to explain this. So, um, if irrationality was one of our epistemic goals, so if we could say that irrationality is derive its value simply from the fact that it is a goal, then it will be kind of, it will be in fact kind of easy to assess our epistemic goals with irrationality because it will be one of these goals. So, and weighing goals against each other is something we do always. So this is not very problematic. So take for instance, the situation in which you don't know whether you should eat the whole chocolate cake or contain yourself with a small piece of it to decide what you should do. What you generally do is that you weight the goal of having immediate pleasure by eating these big things against the goal uh, which is your long-term health for instance and if you think your long-term health is more important then you will go for the small piece of cake and what you have done in order to decide which action is the better one is simply weighing goal against each other health is more important than immediate pleasure let's say so the reason why i give you this example is to show you that if irrationality was one of the epistemic goal we could simply weigh this goal against the other one we have and the coherence and uh, knowledge and so on. And uh, that means that it will be easy. We could really just do it the way I just showed before, like say, okay, rationality plus epistemic goals. Okay, here is this, 
here is a scale of value, where are we now? That would be easy. But in fact, so this is my first premise in this uh, small argument I'm giving. So it will be simple to weigh the rationality of a belief, again, the quality of the epistemic goal that this belief allows achieving if irrationality was itself an epistemic goal. So this is what I've just tried to explain to you. But in fact, as just said, irrationality does not seem to be an epistemic goal. And this has been, in fact, um, argued by quite a few authors. It does not seem that the norm of rationality depends on the goal we have. So it seems we subject to believe what the evidence supports, for instance, completely independently of whether we want this. This seems to be a norm that has nothing to do with what we try to achieve. Uh, so that's my second premise. And if this is so, then it seems that there is no simple weighing procedure uh, when one aim at weighing the irrationality of a belief against the quality of the epistemic goal that it allows achieving. And as I just said, this is something that epistemic uh, innocence presupposes we can do, weighing the irrationality of a belief against the quality of the epistemic goal, goal that it allows achieving. So, but at least, so this is, this is just a conclusion saying, at least, this is not going to be a simple thing to do. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying the simple weighing procedure is not available for this kind of weighing. Yeah? Um, so that's the first problem. And the second problem that I would like uh, to emphasize uh, is that if uh, we were, if it was possible to simply weigh the rationality against the quality of the epistemic goals that the belief allows achieving, then belief will not believe that are irrational but allows achieving epistemic goals will very often not only be epistemically innocent, they will be in fact good. So here is the reason why I think this. So take for instance a belief which is quite irrational, so minus eight, yeah? Quite irrational belief, but this quite irrational belief has amazingly powerful, positive epistemic consequences, plus 16. So nothing precludes that a very irrational belief with a lot of, with a very powerful contribution to our epistemic goals to not only stay below this line here, the zero line, why could it not be simply good? So goes up to this part of the scale, which is where the positive value uh, values stand, yeah? Why not? I mean, that seems to be a perfectly possible, absolutely possible. And um, so what does it mean is that if it was possible to weight the rationality of, of our beliefs here, again, the quality of the epistemic goals that they are achieving, it should be possible for some even very irrational beliefs to be not only epistemically innocent, but simply good, all things considered, as I try to illustrate with this scale here. Yeah. So here, I'm not sure what uh, Lisa will say about this, whether she would be happy with this consequence, but this seems to be a consequence of the fact that we can wait irrationality against the positive consequences of the belief, yeah. Okay, so my conclusion now. So what I've tried to show in this talk is first that the notion of epistemic innocence requires that the irrationality of a belief could be weighed against the quality of the epistemic goals that these beliefs allow achieving. That seems to be a presupposition that uh, Lisa does not spell out in her book, but I find it uh, quite plausible. Um, the second conclusion uh, that I hope I had reached is that we cannot simply weight uh, the rationality against the quality of the epistemic goals in the way, for instance, I can weight my, the immediate pleasure I get by eating the chocolate cake against uh, its dramatic effect for my health, yeah? So for instance, 
So I can do this because these are two goals that I can split wins against struggle. That does not seem to be a possibility as far as uh, irrational beliefs are concerned. And um, so I think uh, that I will be extremely curious to know what uh, Lisa will say about this. So how does the weighing procedure works according to her? So I thank you for watching this talk. Uh, and I hope everything was clear enough. And uh, I hope we also, I also get comments for this once. Bye.